Coming up on our newscast tonight. The nation's defense ministry renews calls for Japan to stop inappropriate media campaign over the two sites' military radar dispute. According to Tokyo's efforts to divert attention from international opinion unfavorable to the country using a recording from its maritime patrol aircraft, South Korea says Japan should offer accurate evidence that can be scientifically and objectively verified by experts. To commemorate Gwanghwamun Square's 600 years of historical and democratic significance, a massive renovation plan is unveiled. The city of Seoul will invest some 92 million U.S. dollars to create cultural spaces, make the area pedestrian-centered, and expand underground zones that connect strategic points including City Hall subway station. The nation's trade ministry and the Korea International Trade Association discuss ways to support local exporters. The session is to be held quarterly as they need to be prepared against possible factors that can slow down growth. News Center begins now. It's 8 p.m. here in Korea, live from our studio in Seoul. This is Arirang News Center. Welcome to our program, Daniel Cha. The nation's defense ministry once again urged Japan to accept a scientific and objective process to verify the facts in the two sites' recent military dispute. This comes after Tokyo released an audio recording it believes proves that the Japanese patrol aircraft was targeted by a South Korean warship in the East Sea. Seoul's response? Scientifically and objectively, the recording proves nothing. We start things off by connecting to our defense ministry correspondent, Park Ji-won, right now. Ji-won, what do you have for us at this hour? Daniel, South Korea's Ministry of National Defense expressed deep concern and regrets to Japan this evening over the announcement. Tokyo's defense ministry said Monday evening on its website that it is ending consultations with South Korea over the matter and it released audio files that it claims to be the sound of electric waves from the targeting radar. Seoul's defense ministry said, however, the unidentified sounds provide nothing that can be verified scientifically or as evidence, such as the date it was recorded, the location, or the direction and frequency of the supposed radar emissions. Let's take a listen to what the defense ministry spokesperson had to say. The sounds presented by Japan are unidentifiable mechanical sounds from which we can never verify the exact detection date, angle of direction or characteristics of the radar frequencies, which are the elements that South Korea has demanded for the sake of objectivity. South Korea once again urges Japan to provide accurate evidence and accept a scientific and objective verification with the participation of radar experts from both countries. A South Korea radar expert also said the audio files do not prove anything, lacking the key evidence of system log files. The sound released by Japan is a process of mechanical sound, thus we cannot confirm that it is the sound related to the first control radar's frequency. In addition, Japan did not provide a system log file to prove its claim that the sound was acquired at the site. South Korea's defense ministry also said the key matter of the dispute is what it called Japan's unmannerly low-altitude flight near a South Korean warship on a humanitarian operation to rescue another ship in distress. It asked Japan to prevent it from happening again and to apologize. The ministry stressed, however, that South Korea will continue to pursue defense cooperation bilaterally with Washington and with Tokyo. Well, that's all that happened now. Back to Daniel. All right, Juan, thank you for those updates. We appreciate it. Moving on to a different story now. South Korea and America's top diplomats exchanged views on the recent high-level talks between Pyongyang and Washington during a 90-minute phone meeting this morning. According to the nation's foreign ministry, the duo agreed to work closely together to ensure the North Korean envoy's recent visit to the U.S. can successfully lead to the implementation of the Singapore Joint Declaration. Minister Kang kyung hwa and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo also discussed their defense cost sharing and promised to come to an agreement soon over the long overdue issue. They were initially expected to meet in Davos this week, but that plan was scrapped as Pompeo cannot attend that forum. 
Over in Sweden, senior officials from North Korea and the U.S. kicked off working-level talks. They're hoping to make some progress on a second summit between their leaders. Kim yo sun fills us in on the latest. Working-level talks between delegations of North Korea and the United States are being held in Sweden in an effort to prepare for a second Kim Trump summit. North Korea's Vice Foreign Minister Choi Sun hee and U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Steven Began kicked off their meeting on Saturday local time and haven't appeared in public since. This is their first meeting since Began became Washington's Special Representative for North Korea in August last year. South Korea's nuclear envoy Lee Do-hun has also joined them for three-way talks, which are likely to focus on setting the summit agenda. The three officials are meeting at a highly secured retreat located some 50 kilometers northwest of Stockholm. This comes as Pyongyang's top nuclear envoy Kim Yong-chol arrived in Beijing on Sunday after wrapping up his three-day visit to Washington. He met with President Trump to discuss the details of a second summit and also hand-delivered a personal letter from North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Last Friday, when the North Korean official met U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Pompeo said it's time for Pyongyang's denuclearization commitments to be executed and implemented. He revealed his remarks during an interview with Sinclair Broadcast Group as he described the Trump administration's efforts to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. Now it's left to be seen whether the talks in Sweden can break the current deadlock over denuclearization talks and lead to a productive second summit. Kim Yo-san, Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in spoke about the hotly anticipated second Pyongyang-Washington summit. The South Korean leader called it a chance to bring peace to the peninsula and an event that could determine the fate of the Korean people. Shin se shares with us his remarks. With the next big summit meeting between North Korea and the U.S. slated to take place near the end of next month, though still with no location announced, President Moon Jae-in this Monday made a statement on that high-stakes summit. Chairing the weekly meeting with his senior aides, President Moon sounded hopeful about the summit and its success and said it's an opportunity that will never come again. <laughs> It's the first comment from President Moon himself since the official announcement of the second Kim Trump summit. And while there may be doubts on whether the talks will work out till the end, the president said it's the role of the South Korean people to make sure they eventually do. The South Korean leader added that Koreans are not mere spectators, but the force that has driven developments on the Korean peninsula up until this point, and said this is more urgent to Korea than any other country in the world. The president said with the support of the Korean people, the government will bring about a corresponding foundation on which peace can bring economic benefits. In the past several days, developments have picked up pace. North Korea's top negotiator visited Washington to meet with President Trump and Secretary of State Pompeo, and the two sides are still holding separate working-level talks in Sweden. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. Gwanghwamun Square is known for its political significance after candlelight rallies there played a big role in ousting a scandal-ridden president two years ago. It's a landmark of civic spirit as countless citizens over generations gathered there to call for change and democracy. Which is why the Seoul City government is planning a major expansion of the area to celebrate its historic value. Oh Soo Young provides a glimpse of what to expect. South Korea's iconic Gwanghwamun Square will be expanded into a massive walkable plaza, joining historical landmarks, cultural spaces and transportation links. On Monday, Seoul Mayor Park Won-sun announced the city's plans to invest some 92 million US dollars into renovating the public area in order to commemorate 600 years of its historical and democratic significance, as well as make the area more pedestrian-friendly. 
Under the deep surface concept, the pedestrian strip that currently lies in the centre of the street will be increased nearly fourfold to 69,000 square metres. The statues of King Sejong and Admiral Yi Sunshin will be moved to either side of the street to make the Gyeongbokgung Palace and Pukhansan Mountain area clearly visible from the square. To promote greenery, the city plans to plant trees and miniature gardens between buildings and on rooftops, and install a sunken garden, stretching from the pedestrian strip into the underground area. Under the plan, the underground areas will also be expanded, joining City Hall and Gwangamun subway stations, to create spaces for concerts, exhibitions and other cultural and educational purposes. The GTX-A subway line, which will run from Paju in the north to Tongtan in Gyeonggi-do province in the south, will make a stop at the underground area once it is built, transforming the area into a major transportation hub. The city government hopes to complete the renovations by May 2021. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. South Korea's sports industry is expected to be a major growth engine in the fourth industrial revolution to provide greater support to the sector that can drive the country's future economic expansion. The government established a mid- and long-term plan. Won jung Hwan outlines what they are. South Korea aims to drive economic growth with a new sports industry development plan. The Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism announced on Monday a five-year development plan for the sports industry to actively respond to the changing technological environment and establish its own growth engine. The domestic sports industry is expected to grow to nearly 9 billion U.S. dollars by 2023. The ministry laid out various plans and projects to help foster this growth. First, it plans to support technology development in the sports market, such as the use of smartphones, to foster the public's participation and viewing service in the sports arena. It also said it will create a big data platform linking the health and sports industries, for example, by collecting data on people's physical health and ability in order to foster the country's healthcare market. In addition, after positive feedback, it will expand this school visual sports room project to include public sports facilities. The project helps people in remote areas to enjoy sports through state-of-the-art VR technology. The ministry also aims to focus its attention on the growth of sports-related companies over the next five years. It plans to expand its support for the entire period of a company's growth, especially for startups and small firms, in order for them to grow into global companies. And of course, through the support, the ministry also aims to establish new jobs amid the sluggish employment situation in the country. Won Jong-hwan, Arirang News. Multiple economic institutions forecast the nation's export growth will slow down in 2019, mainly because of the ongoing trade war between the U.S. and China. During the first three weeks of January, outbound shipments dropped by almost 15 percent on-year. To tackle this issue, the government held a meeting with trade-related organizations. Ko Ryuni has the highlights from that session. The latest figures released by Korea Customs Service on Monday paint a grim picture for the nation's export growth for this year. Exports in the first 20 days of January dropped by 14.6 percent compared to the same period last year. The agency attributed the fall to a decrease in exports of semiconductors and petroleum products. Semiconductors, which account for around 20 percent of overall exports, dropped by almost 30 percent. Analysts have been pointing to lower demand and a fall in memory chip prices. This is mainly due to a decrease in investment in data centers, which had been the main driver of the price rally. In terms of export destinations, shipments to China dropped by more than 22 percent during the same period. And one possibility is that the trade war between the world's biggest economies is having a chilling effect in Korea. To turn things around, Korea's trade ministry and the Korea International Trade Association met on Monday to discuss ways to support local exporters. Trade Minister Song Yun-mo sat down with trade-related organizations and company representatives and promised to hold these meetings every quarter to listen to their difficulties. Some measures discussed include expanding support for trade insurance provided by Korea Trade Insurance Corporation. Minister Song said the government will continuously work with the private sector to deal with uncertainties coming from the slowdown in global trade growth and in the semiconductor market and the drop in international oil prices. 
He added that businesses should also participate in those efforts by coming up with new export products and destinations. Kuruni, Arirang News. Official figures show China's growth rate fell to a near three-decade low in 2018. This is mainly due to business activities lagging amid trade tension with Washington. However, Beijing remains optimistic about its economy. Kim ji has the full story. Preliminary data from China's National Bureau of Statistics released on Monday show that the growth rate of the world's second largest economy expanded by 6.6 percent last year, the lowest level since 1990. China's fourth quarter gross domestic product grew 6.4 percent, the slowest pace since the 2008 global financial crisis. Although the Chinese economy is facing a downward pressure, the statistics agency says the growth rate has remained steady over all, pointing to a near 6 percent on-year increase in industrial output, while retail sales soared by more than 8 percent in December compared to a year earlier. Initial calculations show that the annual GDP was around 90 trillion Chinese yuan. According to comparable prices, the Chinese economy grew by 6.6 percent over the previous year and has achieved the expected growth goal of around 6.5 percent. The agency added China's trade dispute with the U.S. has affected the growth rate, but added the impact was manageable. It says Beijing was already trying to manage a slowdown under its new economic model, even before the trade route with Washington, by focusing more on high-tech, high productivity and shifting away from resource extraction and low-wage manufacturing activities. Kim ji Arirang News. More sexual abuse accusations were raised by a group of South Korean athletes. Meanwhile, Chun Myung-gyu, the former vice chair of the National Skating Union, had a press conference to deny some of these allegations. Yoon Jung-min updates us on the growing scandals in the sports sector. In a press conference on Monday, the Young Skaters Association and independent lawmakers Hun Hye-won accused more incumbent coaches and trainers for allegedly committing sexual abuse on young skaters, including underage athletes whose identities were withheld. The victims are concerned of retaliation against them if their identities are publicly disclosed. Even now, they're in fear. Who is to take responsibility for creating such fear? The skating body also condemned Chun Myung-gyu, professor at the Korea National Sport University and former vice chair of the Korea Skating Union, for allegedly attempting to cover up a series of allegations raised by victims, including short track Olympic champion Chim Seok-ki. The victims have called on investigation on Chun for wielding influence on the skating field and turning a blind eye to the crimes. The association urged a thorough proof into all abuse cases as well as an intensive audit on the National Sports University. On the same day, Chun also held a press conference and apologized for the overall situation, but he also managed to leave some questions by reporters unanswered. I was not well aware of the sexual abuse on Saki. I also did not know that the perpetrator was her coach. I'm not saying that I'm not responsible for the scandal, but I am sorry and I apologize to her and the public. Meanwhile, the Korean Sports and Olympic Committee has reportedly been reviewing whether to abolish the skating union amid the series of abuse scandals. The Young Skaters Association, however, urged high-level officials at the committee, including its president Lee ki to step down. Yoon Jung-min, Arirang News. The measles outbreak in the nation continues to grow. A total of 30 cases confirmed after three new ones were reported in areas previously free of the disease, including the capital. According to the Korea Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the three new patients are in Seoul, Gyeonggi-do province, and Jeollanam-do province, all separate cases. The patients are in their 30s and recently returned from trips overseas to Vietnam, Thailand, and the Philippines. The first case was found last December in Tegu. Experts believe in all cases the virus was carried in from outside the country. The measles can spread by sneezing or coughing. Politicians around the world are taking to social media to spread their message. The trend is growing here in the nation as well. After some enjoyed the benefits of using YouTube for self-promotion, more are jumping on the bandwagon. But according to our Kim min it's a risky venture with some heavy downsides. 
YouTube has become a must for political figures in South Korea thanks to the video platform's potential to reach a huge audience and as a means to get their ideas out unfiltered. Topping the list with the most subscribers is Yoo Shin Min, a former liberal politician. Since he started uploading videos in early January, the YouTube channel he appears on has seen an over threefold increase in subscribers and now is over 630,000. His videos are aimed at helping viewers get background information on the government's policies. Among conservatives, the rising YouTube star is Hong Jun-pyo, former chief of the main opposition Liberty Korea Party. Although he lags behind Yu in terms of subscribers with around 240,000, he has seen that figure steadily crying, garnering attention for his stinging criticisms of the current government. But those two aren't the only Korean politicians with a YouTube presence. From individual lawmakers to political parties as a whole, all of them have been stepping up their online activity and changing with the times. Not all politicians are widely known, so YouTube gives them a platform to reach an untold number of people. Although not all of them will become popular, you're seen as an outsider if you don't have your own channel. A politician's lifespan, in a sense, depends on how much voters know about them. So YouTube is a great tool. While it's a way to get publicity, some say it's a double-edged sword. There's the issue of fake news with politicians making remarks based on unidentified sources or that are altogether false, as there's no gatekeeping on YouTube. And on the viewers' part, they will likely watch only content produced by politicians they like, stoking concerns of ideological bias. YouTube is different from traditional media, meaning it's not regulated by existing laws. Therefore, even if the content is based on fake news, it won't be subject to criminal punishment. Sensitive information might help drive its popularity now, but it could sow distrust down the line and politics could end up tainting YouTube. What's for sure is that the YouTube craze is here to stay, especially ahead of the 2020 general elections. But experts advise politicians to be responsible about what they say, especially in regards to their opponents, and for viewers to consume traditional media as well, so that they can get balanced information. Kim Minji, Arirang News. Last week, the South Korean Navy's Sea Salvage and Rescue Unit carried out its annual winter training. Plunging into the freezing waters, the fearless and dedicated professionals demonstrated they're more than ready for any mission. Kan Young-woo takes us closer to the action. Around 100 members of the Navy's Sea Salvage and Rescue Unit warm up with some light jogging and stretching. They're preparing for what's to come, a plunge into the bitterly cold sea with only a pair of shorts on. Part of their annual five-day winter training, the special unit made the jump last Thursday into waters off the naval military port in Chine, Gyeongsangnam-do province. I felt like my hands and feet were about to fall off when I plunged into the sea, but I was able to overcome the challenge and gain some confidence from my unit as we endured it together. <laughs> The special unit's winter training also included rubber boat paddling and a search and rescue mission from a maritime helicopter. This year's program focused on adapting the unit's members to extremely cold sea temperatures and preparing them for any challenges they may face on the high seas. This year's training is about making sure SSU divers are ready to complete their duties under any circumstances. We'll continue to put the utmost effort into protecting the lives of the people and keeping our seas safe. As one of the South Korean Navy's special forces along with the UDT SEAL, the Ship Salvage and Rescue Unit is well known for its intense and months-long training period, which demands both physical and mental excellence. Their missions normally include ship salvaging, search and rescue, removing obstacles from harbors or other waterways, and the reconnaissance of enemy vessels. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News.
Time to turn to our Michelle Bach at the Weather Center for the updates you need. Michelle, we had a brief cold snap this morning, but it seems like it's over now and temperatures are rising again. Yes, Daniel, and it's going to be much, much warmer than today and with sunnier skies tomorrow. In fact, this mild weather trend is also raising the mercury in the neighboring countries. Now, this is due to the warm westerly wind, of course, but with that wind, smog is also being dragged in from China, which means we will have another round of dusty conditions tomorrow. Taurus starts Tuesday at minus 3 degrees Celsius, while Busan and Jeju starts above the freezing point at 1 and 6 degrees respectively. And afternoon highs will stay in positive territory and of course above seasonal averages. For the rest of this week, we will have a good amount of sunlight with some mild daily highs. I'll leave you with the weather conditions around the world. That's all we could pack into tonight's edition of Arirang News Center. As always, thanks for staying with us.